Good morning, everybody. Good morning, Ana Maria. So, Good morning. Great to see you all. Thanks for coming. I'm uh, Gabriela Ramos. I'm the Assistant Director General for Social and Human Human Science, and I'm so glad to uh, to be here with you. So we'll start in some minutes, no, Ana Maria? Yes, let's uh, wait four or five minutes more. Okay, perfect. Okay.
Shall we start? Okay. Yes. Good. Bonjour, mesdames et messieurs. Bonjour du siège de l'UNESCO à Paris et bienvenue Good à morning, cette... Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Good morning from headquarters of UNESCO and welcome to this uh, third edition of our uh, regional consultation of experts against racism and uh, discrimination. My name is Anna Maria and I'm in charge of the section. Uh, you have interpretation in French and English. You can choose the language by clicking on uh, the uh, globe on your screen. I would like to start with showing you a video with a number of uh, eminent personalities fighting racism and discrimination. This video is available on UNESCO's YouTube channel um, and here it is. Many of us like to think of racism as something from the past, something that no longer holds sway over our societies, something that no longer exists. But World War II took place less than a century ago. Survivors of the Holocaust are still alive today. The Jim Crow's laws were enforced until 1965. We live in a world where people face barriers to education, employment, health, justice and culture just because of the color of their skin. When people are discriminated against, excluded, stigmatized, attacked or even murdered. Just because of where they come from, what they look like or what they believe in. No more. No more. No more. Hoy decimos, basta. El racismo y la discriminación son causados por la ignorancia y el miedo a lo que creemos diferente. But this doesn't have to be the case. You, me, us, we can create the change that we want. By defending quality education for all, we can combat the root causes of deadly stereotypes and prejudices. By developing historical knowledge and critical thinking, we can improve our understanding of the past. By encouraging cultural diversity, especially at the local level, we can build societies that are more respectful of others. By empowering the younger generation, we can help them shape the world to come. So, stop watching from the sidelines. Read, observe, learn, and listen. We must hold ourselves accountable. We must hold our societies accountable. We are all one humanity. Keep quiet is not an option. Is not an option. Do lo que piensas. Speak, Speak up. up. Speak up. Take action. Take action. Take action. Très grand merci à toutes ces personnalités pour avoir fait ce vidéo avec et pour l'UNESCO. I want to thank these personalities for having produced this video with and for UNESCO. And it is now my great pleasure to introduce to you Gabriela Ramos, who is the ADG for Social and Human Sciences, and she is going to present some opening remarks. Madame Ramos. J'ai commencé, mais j'étais muted. <laughs> Now we hear you, perfect. Merci, merci. Start, but I was muted. Thank you. Thank you all for joining this, this uh, discussion, this consultation, which we have launched because we want to learn from you, from the experts. We need to benefit from your experience in order to, to speak up and to take action. As we just heard in the video Anna Maria just showed us, we need to act more strongly 
against racism. Uh, I am going to shift to English because my speech was written in English. Of course, as the Anna Maria just pointed out, you have interpretation available. I'm, I'm really enthusiastic about the quality and the caliber of the experts that accompany us today and, and what we can learn together and do together to fight uh, ras racism and discrimination. You know that UNESCO has a legacy of working on these issues. We were born with the mandate to fight uh, discrimination and, and racism. Uh, we have long trajectory, uh, starting with the 50th semin seminal work of uh, Claude Levis Strauss on the on the on race, um, on also in '78 with the adoption of the Declaration of Race and Racial Pre Prejudice, uh, we have the Slave Route Project, the General History of of Africa, uh, the Master Classes Against Racism that uh, were launched uh, just recently, and we have uh, our network of uh, uh, our coalition of uh, inclusive and sustainable cities. So there is a, a full uh, infrastructure to deal with these issues. We are now uh, advancing a recommendation on ethics of artificial intelligence. And among other things, we're also looking at how to avoid that these biases that allow for discrimination and for uh, lack of, uh, of uh, equal treatment or fair treatment is not translated also in the ethical world. Um, Anti-racism should be uh, a duty that we all carry every day. Uh, now is more important with, with what we are seeing in terms of the COVID pandemic. These are unprecedented time for all of us, but there, it is more unprecedented for certain groups. And we know that the impact of COVID had been completely asymmetric. Uh, the risk of being ill, the risk of dying, the risk of not being uh, covered by the health system, uh, the risk of violence in terms of uh, women, uh, we know what quartiers where neighborhoods are more affected and, and this is something that, uh, that if we want to build back better as the United Nations Secretary General has uh, uh, spotted on, uh, we really need to look at, uh, at, at this asymmetric impact. Uh, this expert consultation also falls in a, in a good timing because we know that uh, the European Union has just launched its anti-racism action plan for 2020-2025. And of course, we are ready to pursue collaboration uh, with the European Commission. Um, and we all know that everywhere, everywhere around the world, even those countries that have very strong institutional and legal settings, uh, they need to continue increasing the efforts against uh, racism. According to the 2019 report of the European Union Agency for Fundamental Rights, only 15 out of the 28 EU member states have dedicated action plans and strategies to combat racism and ethnic discrimination. The world of diversity in the region also brings along a myriad of intersectional challenges. Across Europe, people of Africa descent are confronted with prejudice and exclusion. Racial discrimination and harassment are commonplaces and experiences with racist violence vary, but reach as high as 14%. In the same vein, the effects of anti-Gypsism have further highlighted the plight of the Roma. And this is a long standing issue that we all care about. The challenges linked to this uh, issue range from educational segregation of Roma children, which has seen a 50% increase in the five-year period from 2011 to 2016. Antisemitism is another pressing issue in the region. It has been documented that some of the antisemitic Semitic harassment was experienced by over 39% of those who were asked with an alarming number of respondents and 79% non-reporting the most serious incidents. Of course, this is a sample, but uh, we wish that even in the smallest sample, we would not have this kind of, uh, of numbers. Also in Europe, in Europe, Islamophobia has been a significant issue, which has resulted in barriers to employment, education and housing as a result of the discrimination faced by these groups. So it's not only the discrimination in terms of race or, or, or violence, it's also the opportunities that this group have to uh, fare a better life. And it was also recorded to have remained high in the region, showing an increased trend in discrimination, especially in these areas, as well as in the healthcare, with two in five, 
indicating unfair treatment, 40% indicating for unfair treatment. It must also be noted that many cases of discrimination are still common reported with only 12% reported to the authorities uh, as, as quoted in 2018. So it's, it's, it's a call, it's, it's almost, I would say, it's an emergency call, it's an emergency call. And I think that we we'll all need to step up our efforts to, to counter these numbers and to counter this reality. And as I said, even before COVID, but with COVID, this has been exacerbated in inequality and discrimination that existed in, in all the dimensions uh, were also um, uh, magnified by COVID. Uh, there is the additional angle of gender, and I would put that also because uh, we have seen not only the fact that the women are at the forefront of the fight against the pandemic, uh, the sectors that are being touched by the pandemic, the economic sectors are uh, really uh, where women are overrepresented, but more than anything, this terrible, terrible news about the increase on violence against women and girls, 30% in, in, in France, 50% uh, in Colombia, um, unreported in Mexico, but we know that uh, it's, it's not a safe place for, for women. And therefore, I think this is another angle that we need to, to, to take a hard look in terms of how the lockdown has uh, transformed itself into abuse against uh, half of the population. Um, sexual violence uh, has been committed against uh, women by intimate partners. Uh, and beyond Europe, it has been the case of 243 million women, women and girls aged 5 to uh, 15 to 49 in the last uh, 12 months. So this is, this is something that we need uh, to tackle and this is something that I hope we will be able to hear uh, from you. So UNESCO uh, is uh, stepping up the effort and we do it in the best way we can, actually calling on you, calling on the experts, calling on those that are worried by the same uh, issues and try to grasp what could be done to uh, improve uh, our understanding of the issues, the dynamic of the issues, but beyond that, to get into very concrete actions uh, at the legal level, at the institutional level, uh, action plans to really counter this very uh, important uh, problem. So we will be scaling up our efforts and initiatives in the fight against racism and discrimination. And I'm sure that the insights and perspective that our distinguished experts will share today will undoubtedly inspire reflection and action in the international community and help chart the path towards achieving our collective goal to eliminate any kind of racism and discrimination. So I'm glad to, to be here with you and I'm, I'm all ears uh, to listen to the conversation that will follow. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Ms. Ramos. I will now take the floor. I am your moderator today. Uh, it's a pleasure to be with all of you. My name is Lorenzo Kilgan Grandi. I am a lecturer in city diplomacy at Sciences Po and Ecole Polytechnique in Paris. And I am the founder and chair of a think tank devoted to the analysis of how uh, local governments are contributing to the fight of transnational challenges, such as, of course, uh, uh, inclusion and racism. So, um, uh, I have today the pleasure to uh, moderate a, a session which uh, aims uh, to um, discuss and unpack the societal challenges of COVID-19 pandemic related to racism and discrimination and give actionable recommendation to guide UNESCO uh, work together with its partners. Uh, since the beginning of the pandemic, we have been witnessing, unfortunately, numerous reports in the media about racially motivated acts of violence. Uh, including, of course, aid speech and uh, fake news uh, against populations who are discriminated due to their skin color, ethnic origins, or religious beliefs. Uh, the I Am Not a Virus and the Black Lives Matter movements have created a resounding impact in various continents uh, in the world, uh, exposing previously existing prejudice and discrimination that have continued to plague our societies. The COVID-19 crisis also paved the way for scapegoating and brought to fore the resurgence of far-right movement that spread hate and violence. At the present conjuncture, the reawakening of the moral conscience and the increased global protests in different cities around the world have rekindled 
age-old racial wounds and further unveil the disproportionate inequalities and injustice that these affected populations have unfortunately been enduring. As the series aim at providing an in-depth contextual analysis through a regional perspective, this edition will focus on the European region. We have, distinguished, uh, we have a distinguished panel of speakers who have generously accepted to join us today for this consultation. It's really an honor to be with all of you. I would like to quickly present each one of you before, of course, having the opportunity to exchange with each one of you, uh, starting from Ms. Aida Guyen, Director of Citizen Rights at the Barcelona City Council. Uh, Professor Evelyn Ayer, Professor of, uh, at the National Museum of Natural History in France. Uh, Professor Merdad Pagnadé, member of the Committee on the Elimination of Racial Discrimination, CERD, in Hamburg, Germany. Um, Mr. Moha Jerehu, journalist and 2020 European Young Leader. And last, last but not least, Nick Glynn, Senior Program Officer at the Open Society Initiative for Europe in the United Kingdom. Uh, twice during this edition, we will also listen to a video message by Mayor Siegfried Nagel, the Mayor of Graz in Austria. And Graz is one of the most active members of UNESCO's International Coalition of Inclusive and Sustainable Cities through its European Regional Coalition. A warm welcome to all of you. Thank you very much for joining us today. So allow me to explain a little bit the format of uh, this discussion. We will try to make it uh, uh, as lively as possible. Uh, this is not a traditional round table. Uh, we will have the opportunity to discuss together a series of topics and then we will have a sort of uh, ping pong with each one of the participants analyzing uh, their specific point of view in order to um, have a series of uh, contribution that we can all take uh, uh, away with us and they can guide uh, UNESCO as we have uh, seen for the upcoming future and its uh, programming activities. Um, I would like to uh, begin the discussion by asking a, a first set of diagnostic questions to the uh, participants altogether. Uh, then um, we will, of course, pass, uh, analyze more specifically uh, the details of it. Uh, my first two questions uh, are uh, the first one. In your opinion, how has racism evolved up to the current COVID-19 context? And the second one, what intersectional discriminations are emerging and are re-emerging during the crisis? So something which is strictly related to the evolution that we are currently living now. I would like to start with uh, Professor Evelyn Ayer. Uh, Professor, you have three minutes. Professor, you have three minutes. Well, good morning, and uh, thank you for uh, joining us. Concerning the COVID pandemic, we, all, we have already seen how the uh, I'm not a virus movement, uh, uh, how uh, the fear of what is unknown and what is foreign can lead to xenophobia and racism. That's really the starting point. You start from a fear which is in a way intuitive or natural, but it's based on the wrong premise that the virus is somehow uh, specifically carried by Asian people. How does this lead to uh, direct uh, racist approaches is something that we've actually witnessed. And uh, when you mentioned intersectionality, I wanted to recall that in racist thinking, you find three components. There's categorization, hierarchization, and essential thinking. And these are three components that we experience not only in racist thought, but also in uh, male chauvinism and in, in general, in misogyny. People who tend to think that way, think that way in general. They use the same type of reasoning against women or against anybody they perceive to be different. It's simply a way of thinking and it applies throughout. 
as much against, for example, women as discrimination against people of different origins. So you organize people in, category, in categories, you organize these categories hierarchically, and you consider people with an essentialist uh, approach. In the framework of, in, of a pandemic, I think that it is natural for people to be frightened, and this unleashes uh, certain things because there's less of a control. The society it, it no longer controls what is going on when people are, uh, are locked into their homes. And that is basically what has been happening in the situation. Uh, people experience a lack of control and that's when uh, things start to slip. Thank you. Uh, professor, so one can say that there is a sort of uh, automatism because there were uh, roots uh, upon which racism uh, was uh, developed, uh, and uh, uh, which means that authorities have to come into play, and we will discuss that later on. Uh, Thank you very much. Um, I would just um, like to highlight um, in a little bit of an overview um, some of the aspects of um, racial discrimination that has been exhibited during the COVID-19 um, perspective. And I'm drawing here upon a statement, upon a paper provided by the Committee on the Elimination of Racial Discrimination that has tried to um, sort of um, examine this in a more comprehensive way. Um, first of all, we are experiencing um, uh, racial discrimination stemming from state actors. So we have a number of policies, we have a number of actions um, that have clearly a discriminatory impact um, with regard to, to uh, people who are affected by um, racial discrimination. Secondly, we have, um, as uh, Professor Hayer has already pointed out, um, hate speech and discrimination stemming from, from private actors, starting with um, stigmatization of um, uh, people of Asian descent, um, but not limited to those, of course. Um, moving on to, 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 to aggression, to harassment, um, and other forms of racial discrimination. And we've seen clearly seen um, a rise in these practices during the uh, COVID-19 crisis. Um, and thirdly, we've already seen, um, and this has already, of course, been highlighted by uh, Ms. Ramos, um, a very strong disparate impact of um, the COVID-19 crisis on groups of people, of members of groups uh, who have already been marginalized, who are already um, um, minorities, with regard to um, basically everything, with regard to access to health services, with regard to the numbers of people who are um, seriously affected by the crisis, with regard to, to housing, with regard to employment, and of course, with regard to, um, to education. And just addressing this um, aspect this, uh, that has already been um, mentioned, um, we of course see a strong intersectional dimension in this, um, in this discrimination, both with regard to women, with regard to gender-based violence, but also with uh, women belonging to, for example, the service force that is um, highly um, um, affected by the crisis, and also with regard to children, so intersectional discrimination on the basis of race, gender, age, and other categories. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Professor Bayande. Uh, we see actually that uh, it's it's really a vast issue, as you uh, mentioned. We are uh, to deal with several different uh, facets, several different sides of it that often combine and, of course, have a, a deeper impact, a worsening impact on people that find themselves uh, to be um, racially discriminated and marginalized for a number of reasons. So we. Uh, further expand that later. I would like now to ask uh, uh, the views of uh, uh, Mr. Gereo on the same topic. Hi, everyone. Uh, thanks for uh, inviting me to, to this talk. Uh, well, first, I, I would like to start with the message on the, on the video uh, where they say that we must take action. And I think it's, it's uh, really, we are in the moment to, to take action. Uh, I think at some point during uh, the last years, especially uh, by the institutions, and uh, we have seen like a, a lack of interest in tackling uh, racism. And I think uh, that uh, must end because uh, the society, especially the young people, uh, we are working 
and we are pushing uh, the debate uh, uh, to get uh, some uh, changes in our society, especially uh, related to, to racism. So during the pandemic, I think I, I won't say anything different to uh, uh, my, my colleagues. Uh, the pandemic has, has exacerbated uh, some of the problems that already existed, uh, especially if we talk about uh, people of color or, or migrants or refugees. Uh, we have, and, and one thing I, I would like to point is that uh, during this pandemic, we have seen how uh, migrants have been working to uh, maintain uh, the, the society, working, uh, taking care of the elder people, um, working in, in the fields, and helping us to uh, get through this uh, difficult situation for everybody. But in, the, in return, what we have seen uh, for the migrants has been more exclusion, uh, hate more uh, hate speech, and a lot of uh, politics and institutions uh, trying to blame the trying to blame the migrants, uh, the people of color, uh, for all all these problems. And I think um, if we can say, if we want to say that we are anti-racist that we want to take action, that we want to change things, we have to uh, take a stand and, and work uh, through uh, initiatives, work through um, uh, when we take uh, all these uh, public policies that we are seeing in, in this during this time, uh, uh, not forgetting about migrants and people of color and how all these uh, public policies are uh, have an impact on, on these communities. So we have to put this in our minds, especially through the, uh, by the institutions and take action and try to uh, make these changes because the, so the society is claiming for these changes, especially the young people as we have seen during these past months. And, and we must take that uh, strength and try and use it to, to make those, those changes. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Jerry, who your contribution really uh, show all the irrationality of uh, this kind of conducts. Uh, even uh, harder to uh, understand when we have uh, minorities that are discriminated even in a moment where they reveal all their contribution to society. So something that, of course, needs to be duly addressed. I would like now to uh, ask uh, for a contribution on these topics uh, to Ms. Guillen. Good morning, everybody. Thank you very much for letting us um, contribute to this uh, discussion. I'm gonna try to say different things from like the four uh, people that talked uh, before me on the, same, uh, on the same question. I'm gonna try to do it by, by explaining that definitely the pandemic, as, as said before, exacerbated the inequalities that we already had. Uh, and the problem, let me go a little bit farther on this. Problem is in a situation of uh, competitions for resources, which is the, the situations where we will be uh, right now in a recession, in a socioeconomic uh, crisis during pandemic and after pandemic someday. Um, those who are more, most more vulnerable are the ones that are going to uh, suffer more and are going to be the ones that are used to, um, um, to be discriminated against even more. And that happens to be in countries like the European countries, my, people with migrant background or people that um, uh, have a an color, um, skin color different from the um, majority, from the majority one. And in here, we need to be very careful. And I'm going to be, a, a, just make a point of it, a little bit pessimistic right now, and I'm going to try in further interventions to be a little bit more optimistic. Um, we can see, for instance, in Barcelona, what has happened during the pandemic. Of course, the, uh, the percentage of people who actually needed social help uh, with very basic things, uh, food and housing, who had never had these needs, but because their job just disappeared, it's not that they got fired, 
their job disappeared because of this situation. There was a, a no, no more needed uh, job, uh, most of them at the informal economy. Uh, so the percentage has, rage, uh, ha has uh, raised very much, but it has raised uh, from the people from migrant background even more. So if we have around 25% of the population in Barcelona have migrant background, the people who actually are in uh, social needs that have migrant background go up to 40. And this is showing us how in, what an equality uh, society we have, but it's also, and this is what is very um, dangerous from uh, my point of view, this is full for extreme right. Like this type of uh, data that I just gave you is the data that will be used by extremists from the extreme right to say they are taking all the help, you see? Uh, so we need from the institutions, there is a very, very subtle um, balance on which kind of uh, data and policies you implement in, at this point, um, because definitely uh, racism is just uh, crossing everything in our societies and it's a real threat to uh, social cohesion in our cities right now. Thank you very much, uh, Ms. Guillen, for sharing this uh, view uh, from a city that we know does so much for inclusion and fighting racism, but nevertheless has some obstacles, has some challenges uh, that are emerging and exas exacerbating in this period. So we will definitely uh, further focus on uh, Barcelona experience and how we can find this uh, thin balance that you have mentioned uh, in, in public policies. Um, so uh, last but not least, I would like to leave the floor to Nick Glynn. You have three minutes. Thank you and uh, thanks very much for the invitation. It's great to be able to uh, join everybody and contribute. Um, uh, and I'll try not to repeat what's already been said, but there is so much to say. Um, I think for me, the, f the first comment I make is the word racism, I've never heard it mentioned so many times in, a short, in this short space of time. We really have seen, and I think COVID has done this, um, in the video, the, uh, one of the comments was to stop watching from the sidelines. But actually, I think what COVID has done is to force some people to watch from the sidelines when they were not watching at all before. People have been confined and with George Floyd's murder in the US and everything that that has brought, it has really raised the profile of racism for many people for the first time to make it something real. And the Black Lives Matter protests have, have been a real um, uh, encouragement for people to, to look, to learn, to be educated, to understand that racism didn't just start recently, that it has a colonial and an imperial and an empire history that goes back hundreds of years. And I think for many, it is the first time it has touched their lives. So whilst there's many negatives, of course, from the pandemic, um, I think this is one of the positives in a way that it has raised people's awareness and that we're not talking about diversity necessarily now or inclusion. We are talking about racism. I think this is a first, um, uh, in, uh, a first moment for, for a long time that we've been doing this. Um, some of the things that we've seen, I think, um, to be concerned about is the willingness of the state and the authorities to seize power. And, and in many countries, we've seen that the police have been given powers, extensive powers to control people, to confine people. Um, and while some of those powers may be necessary, for them to be open-ended is not necessary. And we're seeing that in many countries that they don't have an expiry date. And we're also seeing a disproportionate use of those powers on people of colour, um, which is a very concerning and something that we need to look out for going forward. Um, I think the other thing to mention as well is um, in terms of how we have been able to see things that initially or, or, or in the past were impossible to solve with COVID, all of a sudden they've been possible. The, uh, one example, homeless people in the United Kingdom, people who are sleeping on the streets, 
all of a sudden the government found the resources to house those people in hotels. So again, I think COVID has shown us that um, it, whilst it's brought many problems, it has also shown that there can be solutions that, um, that we didn't think were possible before. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Glynn. I think your contribution uh, provide a sort of uh, sum up of uh, uh, this first round of uh, contributions. In fact, uh, we are assisting, as you mentioned, to the rise of uh, focus on racism. And this really is a momentum. And as sad as it is to highlight, as I've done in, the, in, in this first round, um, the difficulty, the additional difficulties uh, that uh, um, um, racism is uh, um, producing uh, across European cities and across the world, it is at the same time an opportunity to um, tackle this crisis with a sort of uh, a political cost which is uh, lower I believe we can say uh, in this moment before in the past, all reforms, all changement comes at a cost. And now that these things are sadly so evident, now that racism is in the eyes of everybody, I believe it's a good momentum, it's an opportunity we should not waste. So now I will uh, uh, have uh, time to exchange a little bit more specifically with each one of you in a sort of a practice which in moderating terms is called a ping pong uh, to evaluate the uh, specific view, the specific opinion and contribution of each of our distinguished uh, uh, participants. So I would like to start with uh, my targeted questions to Professor Payande. Uh, I would like to ask you, Professor, uh, how can UNESCO contribute to raising the visibility of uh, this normative work being done by the Committee on the Elimination of Racial Discrimination of the United Nations? Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Um, I think um, there's, a, there's a, a sort of a bigger background to your question, and that is um, there is an importance for all international region, regional organizations and institutions to more closely work together. Um, there are so many institutions that deal with aspects of racial discrimination, all of them with different mandates, with different uh, emphasis. So I think there's a, um, there's a big need for all of them to take their decisions um, each uh, mutually into account um, and to promote the work others are doing. Um, there's of course a learning, um, uh, the aspect of learning from each other. There's the aspect of um, uh, trying to develop a common normative framework to establish a common set of normative expectations that we have of states and uh, to develop um, best practices. Um, and we've seen an example of this in the COVID-19 crisis um, with many UN human rights institutions, um, the treaty bodies, but also the special procedures issuing statements jointly or, um, or, or separately on some aspects of um, COVID-19 um, and its implications, it's, just, it's discriminatory implications. Um, and I think this is a good example of how, um, how institutions can work together and, uh, uh, and, and raise the visibility, as you said, of each, uh, of each other. Thank you very much, Professor. This component of exchange, of peer learning, of uh, cooperation is definitely uh, one of the fuel of uh, the action of uh, UNESCO and uh, uh, other layers of uh, cooperation, the United Nations in general, and uh, uh, city networks like ICAR. We will focus on that uh, later. In fact, uh, how are cities and countries planning for a long-term uh, inclusive recovery in these uh, difficult situations. Uh, I'm thinking about uh, protection against gender-based violence, uh, equal job opportunities for all, uh, and etc. Hmm. It's difficult for me to sort of evaluate um, what they are doing. What I can speak to a little bit is, of course, what they should be doing. And um, I think here it's important um, to highlight, and um, the committee has highlighted that already in a recommendation on the implications of COVID-19. Um, that states have a number of obligations, um, not only not to discriminate actively, but also to protect people from um, racial discrimination. And um, they also have, of course, the possibility 
to to resort to special measures, to protective measures, to supportive measures, um, with regard to groups that are particularly disproportion disproportionately affected um, by the pandemic. So I think it's it's important first to to highlight that there is an obligation. Um, I think there is second. Um, this has already been mentioned a couple of times, and um, it's all also in the concept paper of UNESCO. There's a need to have more data on um, the dis dis um, proportionate uh, um, effects. Um, and I think here, um, UNESCO could also be a very valuable um, partner for many um, institutions. And thirdly, um, just wanted to highlight an aspect. Um, I think it's important for states and for cities also to have a consultative participatory approach and to um, not only take decisions with regard to how to um, support communities and how to support minorities but to of course include them in the decision making process get their point of view and get their perspective on the specific uh, needs for policies thank you very much uh, uh, professor i think this uh, uh, point that you are uh, uh, discussing actually uh, can um, allow me to transition to a more um, sort of practical perspective that uh, miss Guyen can provide us uh, we are uh, extremely interested in knowing uh, this topic of, uh, of data, of information that has been mentioned by Professor Payande, how the city of Barcelona is dealing with it, how uh, the, there is in fact uh, uh, an action uh, of, uh, um, uh, at local level where you do not have available data. And in, in broader terms, where can this data uh, can be found, what is the contribution of external actors such as the academia, the research uh, universities in filling this gap? Well, I think um, data is of course very important for policymakers. You need the data to make your diagnosis and you need to know what's going on in order to decide what you want to change from that reality and how. And when it comes to the issues we are talking right now, we have been improving very much the data that we have about discrimination cases that are happening in our city. We have an a specific office for non-discrimination. It's a municipal services. It has actually over 20 years now where we are uh, attending people who claim they have suffered a discrimination on many different grounds. And we support and accompany them uh, on their case, even if we have to go to legal advice or psychological uh, support as well, but also mediation processes and some of the cases reparation. Uh, it's uh, a much more interesting path to go along that a judicial uh, process if we are not talking about crimes, obviously, huh? if we are talking about all the types of uh, discriminations. And we have been implementing for the past two years a jointly effort with over 20 associations of uh, our city in order to make a better picture of what the discrimination looks like in the city, because not everybody, not every citizen uh, feels the confidence or has the will to actually get to the administration because most or sometimes it's the administration itself who has discriminated. Uh, so they will uh, go to an uh, association, a civil society uh, group, but they will not come to us as administration. So we need uh, to work jointly with these associations in order to make first a better picture and then second to implement um, the uh, policies to transform, to change that reality. So we have been for the past two years in what we call the Observatory of Discriminations, uh, have done this, um, this joint effort uh, to, um, to get better data on this. And I think we are on a good path in this, in this regard. But then there is other data that we don't have. And then we get to the very interesting issue of uh, indicators of equality. And when you talk about racism and uh, ethnic origin, we don't, we don't collect data on people uh, on this regard um, in Barcelona. We only collect data on nationality and place of birth. Like that's what the registry will say. So if you ask me, for instance, is there a segregation of uh, Roma population? The Roma population in Barcelona, we have some um, um, comment from uh, Eastern countries in, um, in Europe, but the main Roma population has been in our city for 600 years now, over 600 years. Um, we don't know. 
we don't put the tech of Roma people. So uh, when it comes to tackle where the uh, discrimination problems are based on, on data, it is true that we have a burden here uh, that we haven't solved yet. And it's an interesting issue that we are uh, actually debating on our uh, municipal migration city council. We have a participatory consultative body with over 70 uh, migrants uh, associations of the city. And it's a, 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 a constant debate on, on, on this issue. Um, this again, tiny balance of, uh, you know, that we need the data, how do we actually collect the data, what the data is, is used for, and it's a debate we're still on. Thank you very much for your answer. And I'm curious to know a little bit more about the, the council you mentioned. There are um, actually many cities across Europe and across the world that are uh, creating similar uh, initiatives to have a consultation, to have an exchange uh, with the migrant uh, uh, communities, the different kind of uh, minorities, um, and then tackle uh, in a proactive way, in a cooperative way, uh, this kind of problem. So I'm interested in knowing more about that, uh, as well as if you have any example, any concrete example, on how um, the municipality is directly empowering groups in order to become actors and uh, uh, participate in the fight against the uh, races they are actually an object of? Yeah. Well, the Municipal Migration Civic Council uh, go goes back to 1998, so it has uh, some time. Um, and as I said, it has over 70 uh, different associations of the city. Only 25% of the associations of the council are associations that work for migrants. The rest are migrants associations, because that's, I mean, I think it's very important when you look at you know, who has the voice, who is representing who. A lot of uh, migrants associations in our city have a cultural background. So they gather together for cultural issues and national issues as well. So that's very common on the Latin American, uh, from Latin American uh, countries. And, uh, but we also have other type of um, associations um, that are in the council that have more um, advocacy, um, um, you know, activities and stuff. Um, so the, uh, the council works permanently. Uh, we, we have meetings, uh, at least every two weeks, we have a type of meeting uh, with the associations of the council, either in working groups, they decide one topic per year, and we work on that topic. But the way the topic this year is actually for an 18 racist Barcelona. Uh, and we decided in January for the whole COVID thing. And we are right now doing a series of uh, training with the associations of the uh, Municipal uh, Migration Council to the rest of the councils, because there are 30 different councils in, in Barcelona. And we are also um, working on different race awareness um, activities and on a campaign. And the good thing, another very interesting point of the, this participatory bodies, if you allow me, is the, the, the point that we develop, or they actually, the associations of the council, uh, papers on the issues that we uh, tackle every, every year with recommendations, direct recommendations to the uh, city administration and to citizenships. Last year, for instance, the topic was elderly people and migration which is a new topic at the city because most of the uh, migrant uh, population, it's very young, but that is changing and it will change. So there are problems and issues to be foreseen. And the year, previous year was housing and migrant population. So there is a, a real consultative uh, work of the, uh, of the council. And to make it fast about the second uh, question, what do we actually do to empower them? then we get to budget. You actually need to uh, put resources in place. And from a local administration port of point of view, subsidies, uh, resources for projects, it's a straightforward uh, policy. We have in for, for the issues about racism and interculturality, we have 1.2 million euro that we give every year to uh, the civil society uh, associations in the city. And that goes for projects on uh, 
empowerment that goes on, on projects for visibilization of uh, racist um, uh, actions or cases that have happened, go for training, go for race awareness, uh, and many different uh, activities. And that's what we from the administration actually have to do, but it is the key. Thank you very much, uh, Ms. Guillen. And we all know that in terms of budget, the COVID-19 uh, will represent a, a, a further problem, of course, because uh, COVID-19 means uh, not only uh, spending more money, but also uh, receiving more money from different kinds of taxes. So uh, there will be a further need for a form of coordination and cooperation, both vertically uh, with uh, other layers of government, as well as horizontally with other actors from including the private sector that can uh, sort of create uh, not only a collective intelligence, but also a sort of uh, coalition of the willing to uh, create uh, a good um, a good result, to bring results uh, to, to life. Um, I would like now to uh, move uh, to uh, Professor Eyer. Uh, professor Eyer, uh, uh, vous êtes, you are a, a professor of genetic anthropology, so uh, anthropology genetique. And um, this uh, point is extremely important when we talk and analyze. This is a very important point uh, when we look at uh, the root causes of racism. Of course, there is no need to repeat here that uh, that uh, uh, the the uh, concept uh, of race uh, is uh, grounded in very erroneous uh, concepts, and yet uh, they have an impact uh, on the people's uh, psyche at the individual level, but also the collective level uh, uh, on society as a whole. Uh, so how can we combat uh, uh, these uh, issues, uh, this uh, resilience of the concept of race? Uh, how, how can we combat uh, uh, this very deeply rooted uh, prejudice? Okay, thank you very much. And uh, I will speak in French because it is my native language. Well, first of all, uh, I just wanted to uh, pinpoint why uh, racism is still around. Uh, European constitutions were based on the erroneous concepts on racism for 200 years. So you see, we need time now. We need time to uh, uh, free ourselves uh, from this very strong influence. Um, and uh, st statistically, uh, ra uh, well, uh, societies today are uh, uh, less racist than they used to be before, or let's say 30 years ago, but uh, we still need to improve on that. Uh -huh. And uh, well, racism uh, is synonymous uh, with domination. So as soon as you have two groups uh, uh, that are in competition and one wishing to dominate over the other, uh, whereas uh, uh, there is a uh, justice, uh, racism, sorry, involved uh, because there are different interests uh, uh, in different groups uh, and some groups uh, want to take advantage of others. Thirdly, in racism, uh, there is the factor of socialization. We think uh, that people just do what they want and to uh, do and uh, behave the way they do because of their bio biological differences, as if it's something which is inherent to their nature. Now, this is a, a very powerful argument that is often used by racist movements uh, in order to prevent any kind of uh, help to combat inequalities. In the United States, you have the Bell Curve, which shows that biologically speaking, and which is of course wrong, uh, people of uh, African descent had a lower IQ than white people. So there was no point uh, uh, elaborating uh, targeted policies towards uh, these populations uh, because uh, they were inferior by nature. Uh, as far as intelligence is concerned. So uh, these uh, two aspects, uh, uh, in fact, uh, suit a lot of people's uh, purposes. Uh, uh, and uh, this is what prevents uh, people from doing something about combating racism. Um, and in the, uh, the um, Anglo-Saxon world, uh, uh, 
uh, racial categorization is activated by a lot of people who are fighting against uh, racism and the name of fighting racism in fact uh, reinforce uh, racist categorization rather than being uh, in a universal approach uh, taking universal approach uh, so in fact uh, their interpretation of society is based on these uh, pseudo racial differences um, uh, as if the races actually existed and they were not just uh, the product of uh, social constructs. So unfortunately, uh, racism is not uh, uh, disappearing and is not going to disappear anytime soon, uh, at least uh, not uh, if you look at it from the European standpoint. Um, uh, well, thank you very much, Professor. You mentioned this risk of, in fact, uh, reinforcing racism by the actors themselves, uh, by those who are actually trying to combat racism. This is an interesting point. And after I uh, ask the other speakers uh, to take the floor on with this round of questions, I'm going to ask the other speakers what they think about this comment. Well, uh, there is another question concerning the role of academia, the role of researchers, uh, and uh, the, uh, what their specific uh, contribution can be or in this uh, respect. Well, I think that uh, uh, th th there are all these arguments. Uh, the fact that uh, our arguments, our race comes uh, from uh, uh, our roots are in Africa and all of us have ancestors uh, uh, coming from Africa. Mm. We can uh, uh, mention also that there's very little difference uh, in different human populations. Uh, there is no marked difference uh, in different uh, populations. Uh, uh, so basically people, no matter where they come from, are not that different from other populations. Uh, and also uh, racism based on the color of the skin uh, should be combated by showing that uh, the gene involved in the color of the skin is only coding for skin color. So it is by no means uh, a factor that explains uh, different behavior, different thinking, uh, uh, like people who uh, uh, wrongly believe because they think that the color of the skin it goes hand in hand with their intelligence level, their behavior and what have you. Thank you very much, Professor. It's, it's very interesting indeed that you have uh, reminded us that we are all basically migrants uh, in some respect, that we all have ancestors coming from the same place. So let us not forget that. with the UNESCO Chair on Urban Policies and Citizenship under the framework of the project Policité, which creates dialogue spaces to avoid urban violence between the youth and the municipal police. Of course, you know what we are talking about. Um, how can we encourage these dialogues in a constructive and sustainable manner? Thank you. Yeah, for people that don't know about Policité, it's a project in Lyon where young people, social workers and professionals and the local police have eventually got together to break down some barriers between them. Um, I think these kind of projects um, expose the talent that is out there and the energy that is out there to actually break down barriers between people between the citizens and the police. Um, and they can be successful. And one of the things we've seen is that some relatively modest support for those kinds of projects uh, can work and that you get a disproportionate amount of energy and output and creativity uh, from projects like this. And I'd encourage people to, to look up the project actually and the, and the report that they produce, which is really, which is really uh, brilliant, I, ha I have to say, even though I'm biased. Um, but I, I think it takes several things. It takes finding the talent in the, in the community. Um, and so you need effective local networks in which to do that. You need, uh, you will always find energy, energetic and creative young people. Um, it's maybe harder to find committed professionals who are willing to put the young people first and to 
um, to be to be in it for them rather than for their own ends to 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 let them shine. Um, and of course, even more difficult finding people in police circles and indeed in other authorities who are willing to take the step to firstly admit that something's wrong and that there is a problem that needs resolving and secondly to do something about it. I think one of the things we find with these kind of projects is we shouldn't make the mistake of thinking that they fix racism, they fix racist police violence, that they fix discrimination uh, in communities. They don't do that, but they are a tool that can break down some of those barriers. Uh, I, I, I would say we should also note that there is some fragility there, that those, with the gains that can be made can be broken sadly very easily by bad practice from the police, by a bad incident, a single incident actually can make a, a, have a really negative impact. So, um, so we, shouldn't, we shouldn't put too much faith in those kind of approaches, but by the same token, they really can make a positive difference. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Glynn. We see that actually there is some optimism there. Of course, uh, uh, we have to frame it uh, in the, into something reasonable. But when you empower uh, actors and civil society, when you empower uh, social groups, you have an answer. So uh, definitely administrations are not alone. They can count on uh, local energies. Um, I would like to ask you, um, how can actors such as the open society and civil society be involved in this anti-racist movement? How can we create this coalition of the willing that uh, we were talking about before? I think I go back to some of the comments made already about investment. Um, we as open society, uh, in the light of the George Floyd murder and uh, the Black Lives Matter movement globally, made a £220 million commitment to uh, work on racism globally. I mean, when you say globally, it's not so much money, but of course it's still a big investment. Um, I suppose one of the things that we have to uh, do always as civil society is to be explicit around tackling racism. And I mention the word explicit as very important because one of the risks for civil society is that the support for anti-racism and anti-racism organizations can get watered down in other, uh, other policies and in other approaches. Um, and I think it's important to, to have that focus on it um, for, for, for go, going forward. And not just now, that we make sure that this is not just a, um, a moment um, in history where there's some energy and then we uh, fall away, that this has to be commitment, long-term commitments to tackling racism because it will take uh, a, lo a lot of time. I think one of the other challenges for civil society is in a sense, we feel like we're the good guys, that we, um, that the problem is something that we help to support out there. And of course, civil society and the structures that um, we are built upon, some of those are problematic. They are patriarchal. Um, they are built, you know, in, in some senses in um, they, they can have a colonial or an, um, uh, that, that kind of um, structure to them. Um, how representative are they? Are, are, are we as civil societies a very important question? Are we supporting the work um, uh, for people that are disproportionately affected for racialized communities? Or indeed, do we as civil society um, look like and um, are part of that community? And that's a very important distinction to make. Um, we have to challenge white privilege as civil society ourselves and look at ourselves to make some of those changes. Um, and the final note I'd make as well around the, the, um, the, the difficulty around data collection. Um, and I think a, a previous contributor said that, you know, we don't know whether racism exists because we don't have data. I would say we do know that the racism exists and there's different kinds of data. And I think we have to, as civil society, work harder to extract and to hold authorities to account for what data they do collect 
that might not be um, di uh, race data, but it might be proxies for race data that can be equally effective in uh, demonstrating what some people want, which is st statistical proof that racism is occurring. Um, we need to be more creative and I think more inventive in how we do that so that um, that, 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 that supports the, the scientific and the academic approach to this work, which is also very much needed. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Green. I think this uh, topic of uh, data and how it is used and communicate with population is absolutely of paramount importance in the uh, building of the uh, world of tomorrow. And on that, I would like to ask uh, for the insight of Mr. Gerejo, and more specifically, if he could uh, uh, provide us with his uh, opinions on how uh, can social media play a role in promoting racial justice? Okay, um, well, I think uh, right now uh, uh, social media is playing a key role in promoting racial justice. We have seen it uh, recently with the Black Lives Movement uh, since uh, the times of the uh, Ferguson uh, riots until now to look after um, George Floyd's uh, assassination. And uh, we have seen that uh, social media had a, few, a huge impact in both ways. In one way is uh, reporting the racist cases uh, that uh, in other times we probably won't see, as we've seen in the uh, Just Place case. Uh, thanks to the social media, we knew uh, what happened and we were able to uh, react to, to that uh, injustice. So I think uh, that's one of the ways. And the other way is that uh, in the social media, I think uh, we can find there like some, some problems, uh, especially related to our private data, but also we have uh, some advantages. And one of them is that uh, every day, uh, more, more people can have access to the, to the social media and, uh, and we can share more information. And I think that's important because uh, some voices that has, have been historically uh, excluded in the global conversation on different topics, we, can, we are not talking about racism, but we find it in uh, feminism, in the movement uh, uh, against uh, homophobia, or uh, now in the movement for uh, climate justice. Uh, we are seeing, we are seeing uh, how uh, social media are having a huge impact uh, because of the because a lot of voices uh, are seeding information and then making people more aware of, of what's happening uh, right now. And I think uh, also the institutions and also the governments should uh, listen to what's happening in the social media. I don't, I don't say that they have, that should be like the main source of information, but I think they should uh, listen to what's happening in the social media because uh, especially for young people, uh, is like the, probably the main source of information and the principal way that when we express uh, our situation, our, uh, what we are thinking. And, and I think uh, we should guarantee, guarantee that everybody can have an access to the internet and have an access to the social media and find this place a, a place where we all can exist. Mm, because uh, what I see is that uh, some people, I, I'm very active in, in Twitter and, and during these years I've been talking about uh, racism, reporting racist cases, and, and talking talking about uh, anti-racism, and I've uh, I've received a lot of hate in the in the social media, and I think that's important to point it because if we don't uh, guarantee that we all can access uh, to the social media, uh, the social media will be just for a few people and not for everybody. So that's that's important. Thank you very.
uh, race and justice and, and all these movements. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Jerehu. Um, I know uh, Ms. Guyen would like to uh, have a, a little, um, uh, add a little point on this uh, issue that you have mentioned that probably is really linked to the activity of uh, the city of Barcelona. Yeah, thank you, Lorenzo, for giving me the floor. Actually, I wanted to react to, to the point of, um, um, of data again, and if we, because I, Nick, I didn't say that uh, we need the data to prove that there is racism, because there is racism for sure. But then when you, when you actually want to tackle policies that go to the people that actually don't know they are discriminating, and are those who are privileged, you actually, I'm going to give you an example, discrimination in the access to housing, right? Uh, we have been four months working with uh, a lot of um, associations, and this has been in the agenda of many civil society associations for years now. Uh, it depends on the color of your skin. It will be easier or not to get a, a, a rent, um, to get a house, right? Uh, and then you, you go and try to prove it because we have a legal framework that it says that it's not allowed to discriminate based on the um, skin color. But then you don't get the you don't get the proof. You don't have you can't prove those cases because at the end it will be you don't have anything by written. At the end it's well you know the the owner can choose whoever he wants and it's not because it's he's black you know it's because you know whatever whatever other other grounds so and it's difficult. So we haven't in in the past. So we need data for this because then you go and talk to the owners' associations. You go to the bars and you say there is a problem. We have a problem here and they say no we don't. Where where is the problem? Where is the data? So um, we have been developing in the, in the past uh, months a uh, testing, actually. I want this proxy testing, and we'll give the uh, results actually next week. And we found out we were um, replying to um, renting um, announcements with two, two different types of people. You either had a name. We didn't say anything about where you come from because it was all written. You either have a name that sounds Catalan name, a Spanish name, or you had a name that sound Arabic, Muslim. And we found out that there was a 20% less chances that they will even reply to your first email if you had an Arabic um, name. So with that, we can go to the owners association and say, you see, we are actually, we have a problem here with this. Because it's not even that they don't get to, to rent the house, they don't even get a reply with the first uh, email that you send. So it's even worse. You have 20% So I think I agree with you that we need innovative uh, ways of finding this data. But it's also true that the data, it's, it's also needed. When you go to policymakers, when you go to what you actually need to do, this is very important. So we need to go ahead with this um, type of uh, discussions. Thank you very much. A lot of food for thought uh, uh, to uh, fuel uh, the continuation of our uh, discussion. I have just one last uh, question for Mr. Jerehu. Um, the element of uh, young people has been mentioned before, in particular by uh, Mr. Glynn. Um, how uh, do you see the role of youth in the fight against racism and discrimination? Again, I think uh, uh, we are playing like a, a key role in, in, in these changes. As I said before, we have seen uh, during the past months, especially before the, the pandemic, how the Fridays for Future movement have been working really hard, have been demonstrating in the, in the streets of every part in the, in the world. And I think um, what's happening with, the, with all this movement, with all this Black Lives movement and, and the racist uh, movement in in the whole world uh, is uh, pushed uh, by the by the young people, but uh, I think uh, we have uh, a problem, and is that most of the times we put like the, the debate, uh, we push the the conversation, but we are not in the place uh, where the decisions are, are made, where the decisions are taken. And I think that's the, the, the next step. We should be in the, in, the, in the institutions. We should be where 
their decisions are and taken because they are affect directly to to our to our lives and and I think uh, we probably uh, at one time at any time we have heard about uh, this um, people saying that uh, we must not uh, be in politics or we must not uh, uh, talk about these things and I think that's uh, really harming especially for for young people because we are constantly uh, giving our knowledge uh, doing our work uh, but we are not in the place where decisions are made and we have to uh, be more in contact with all these uh, initiatives. We have to be more in contact with the institutions. The institutions should make, uh, should be like a kind of attractive uh, for the young people. Uh, I think uh, a lot of people find the institutions kind of uh, boring or kind of like really far from the, uh, uh, from what they are uh, working for, and I think that uh, distance should be um, uh, more short because uh, we have a uh, kind a lot of things to 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 do in the in the in this world uh, and to change a lot of things. and And I think that's that should be the the next step. What I see uh, a little point. When I, when I see, uh, when we talk about why migrants or uh, racialized people cannot access to, to work, and um, I, I see the same problem when, when, with what we see with the young people uh, to the administrations, to, to the uh, politics, is that um, uh, we are always kind of uh, being uh, excluded being like uh, some some things uh, that we can um, share in these in these places, kind of our new ideas, our new perspectives. These are not uh, seen as valuable, but uh, other things that probably are uh, related to, like kind of other people, are seen as more valuable. And I think we must uh, change this. There are things that of young people that should be uh, uh, seen as valuable as what uh, elder people uh, are sharing in these in this places. And I think that's one of the uh, key things that we must change. Thank you very much, Mr. Jahil. So a lot of potential, but also that needs to be activated in a, in a coherent, in a good way. Uh, so there, there is need for an additional effort for by public bodies and, and private actors to uh, really uh, empower and give the floor to uh, young people. Uh, thank you very much. I would like to ask the, all the participants uh, a first uh, common question, which is about uh, uh, the uh, intersectionality of issue that has been mentioned before, and more specifically, how can the role of women be optimized in the struggle against racism and discriminations? And how can we leverage this role uh, who would like to start on this uh, topic? So we all know that um, there is a sort of uh, accumulation of uh, uh, bias uh, and I would say barriers uh, to uh, uh, minorities that are identified by race, by religion, uh, also the political affiliation and the fact of uh, being uh, a woman. So this can be uh, an additional struggle, but nevertheless, just like, uh, um, just like uh, uh, young people, of course, women are a component of society that can be extremely important and should be addressed in a coherent, in a correct way uh, to become an actor against uh, this uh, uh, double bias they suffer about the barriers to, uh, namely, uh, to uh, just to name one which is very evident, an object of uh, discussion, barriers in the uh, field of work and employment. 
Does anyone would like to answer this question? Yeah, I just want. Ah, okay. <laughs> sorry, no, just a, a few, a few points. Um, it's not always clear that uh, being a woman is worse than being a man in relation to discrimination. It depends on the group of people who are discriminated. So I think uh, more study. I come back to what uh, other participants say. We need more data. We need good data and more data. And when you want to study intersectionality, you need even more data because you're dealing with interaction. So uh, from the studies I have seen in France, it's not clear that uh, being a woman increases the discrimination. Uh, on the contrary, for some group, being a woman decreases the discrimination, but in other group it increases. So. Uh, I think we, we really need good data before, uh, before trying to do something about this problem. Thank you very much, Professor Rier. I think uh, Ms. Guillen would like to intervene and then uh, uh, Mr. Glynn. Actually, I just want to give data on this because in the uh, testing I was telling you about on housing, we did the, uh, both with different uh, names and we also did men and women to see if gender actually had uh, a role in here. And gender had a role, but on a positive way, actually, because women were actually got more chances to get an answer and it has to do with women being more reliable when it comes to uh, contracts and when it comes to money issue about uh, management. Uh, that men in general. So I agree very much with Evelyn that um, it depends on the case and it depends on, on the issue. We have to be careful not to say that it's always a disadvantage. Thank you very much for specifying that. I have to say in my, my research is I have found that this point uh, uh, written many times. So it's important to access your uh, testimony to have uh, the possibility for you to share this data so that uh, what reveals to be partially false, uh, to say the least, uh, it uh, can be corrected and the situation can be analyzed in a more uh, correct way. So, uh, Mr. Glynn, would you would like uh, to add something? Yeah, just to follow that up really with two examples that show both things. I suppose the first is, you know, generally police violence tends to be against men that's the majority of it that's the vast majority of it but not always and women suffer at the hands of the police as well um, but i think one of the things that covid has actually shown us is the irony and the systemic um, nature of the banning of the veil where women are and the intersectionality of that with race and with religion as well where women are harassed prosecuted abused for wearing an item of clothing and how everybody says how very difficult it was that women were wearing the veil and that we couldn't see their face and we couldn't communicate and all of these um, inaccuracies actually and then everybody has to wear a face mask and all of a sudden it's okay so it shows you know that there is something else behind um, some of these policies and practices um, at, a, at a strategic, at a, at a high level that are having a disproportionate impact on, in this case, women, women of colour um, and women of the Muslim faith. So there are examples on both sides for sure and, uh, and, and I agree. Uh, more, more research, more data is necessary but we can sort of see the big picture with some of those examples. Thank you very much, Mr. Glynn. I would like to ask Professor Payande, what is the point of view of the lawmaker? What is happening at the international level to tackle these uh, two separate issues? Is there a, a sort of a commonality of intents or you see them as developing as separate uh, tools? I think, um, I mean, all that has been said now about intersectionality is of course right. We always have to look at the specific cases and the specific context but i think um, the important starting point is that we actually look at those cases and that we see that um, women belonging to racialized groups um, have a different status than men belonging to racialized groups and that um, this uh, question has to be tackled what we can see well i'm a member of the committee on the elimination of racial discrimination and there's a committee committee on the elimination of discrimination against women so from the beginning these 
aspects, these different um, uh, different criteria of discrimination have been sought uh, sort of in a separate way. But what we can see now, um, especially in the last years, is that this this moves much more into the focus. Um, so you, you can hardly see any any recommendation by one of the committees that tackles discrimination that doesn't in one way or the other uh, mentions this intersectional um, aspect. So I think it's moving into the focus. Um, another sort of intersectional axis that we have to consider, of course, is the socioeconomic um, dimension. And that, of course, we've seen in the COVID um, pandemic um, that, they are, that, that, that people belonging to racialized groups, to marginalized groups also are hit harder from an, uh, in a socioeconomic way. Um, and of course, here we also have a special status um, of, of, uh, of, of women belonging to uh, racialized groups, but they also, their, um, um, their situation is also specific. So I think the, the basic point is um, we have to always look at all these, uh, how these axes of discrimination uh, work together and, and, and uh, marginalize specific groups in specific ways. Thank you very much, uh, Professor. We really see the uh, utility of this kind of consultation uh, happening now with uh, experts. So, um, Mr. Gerero, would you like to add something on the uh, topic of intersectionality and discrimination on one side, racial, and on the other side uh, uh, against women? Yeah, I would like to point uh, what's happening with the uh, domestic workers in Spain. Uh, nearly 70% of them are, are migrants. Um, and during the pandemic, we have seen how they have an increasingly important role uh, during this pandemic, taking care of the uh, uh, elder people. But in the other way, they still have, uh, are being excluded because most of them are uh, undocumented, undocumented and their working conditions are really bad. Most of them uh, don't rest, uh, they just rest like in uh, Sunday afternoons and work like more than uh, 12 or 14 hours per day. And during the, these past months, we have been pushing uh, for um, uh, regularization to uh, give documents to, to, to uh, these migrants and to for them to for they can just uh, have their uh, fundamental rights and I think that's the, the the main point and I think that's important because that's one of the consequences of what's happening when you exclude migrant uh, people uh, specifically uh, related to uh, to women. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Gerero. Um, we are running a little bit short of time, so um, I take this opportunity to um, uh, ask the audience. As you can see, there is a, a, a chat. You can use this chat to address uh, questions to a specific uh, uh, speaker or to the, the whole group of the speakers, if you prefer. And uh, before moving to this uh, Q&A uh, session, I would like to um, ask the technical uh, office to show the video of uh, Mr. Siegfried Nall, mayor of Graz in Austria, who uh, couldn't be here but uh, sent his answers to uh, the last questions. Mr. Mayor Siegfried Nagel, in your opinion, how has racism evolved up to the current COVID-19 context? As far as we know from the City Anti-Discrimination Office and the UNESCO Human Rights Center in Graz, hate speech on the internet has increased. Most of the postings shame people from other parts of the world, starting with the hate against Chinese and Asian people, Italians and finally refugees and migrants are made responsible for the spread of the pandemic. The city government is challenged to clearly stand against such escalations and to inform about the facts. What is the role of cities in the fight against racism and discriminations? Racism can be structural on one hand and occurs in institutions or can be ingrained in the legislature. On the other hand, it happens among individuals in everyday life. Thus, two main strategies for cities need to be, first, to 
detect and eliminate resist and discriminatory structures in institutions, and second, to create a culture of mutual respect, inclusion, and human rights. Graz is a UNESCO city of human rights city, and we try to integrate a human rights-based approach in all our activities. Graz is also a member in the European Coalition of Cities Against Racism, and we set up various policies against discrimination and participate in the 10-point action plan, which we renewed in this year. Graz already set up a wide range of institutions preventing and actively fighting discrimination. We have a Human Rights Council, an interregional interreligious council, a women's rights council, and an advocacy institution for children's an ombud or a public advocate for people with disabilities, as well as an anti-discrimination office, to only mention a few. Furthermore, the recently founded UNESCO Center for Human Rights has a specific task to train human rights professionals, not only from all over the world, especially for Eastern Europe and for North Africa, um, here in our city, here in Graz, in order to facilitate a culture of human rights. What is the added value of city networks, such as the International Coalition of Inclusive and Sustainable Cities, which includes the European Coalition of Cities Against Racism? In my opinion, a network is vital for learning about trends, exchanging of experiences and good practices. It also gives the important topic of human rights more visibility and is a good framework for projects and change process with the administration. The UNESCO Human Rights Center, for example, will hold an international academy in order to exchange knowledge on human rights implementation, research and evaluation next February. We will invite experts from all over the world in order to think together about how we can make our cities into places where people can live in peace and enjoy a high quality of life. So thank you very much to the mayor and we see the importance of uh, local leadership in tackling these issues. Leadership is of paramount importance and in difficult times where we are living, we really need uh, a leadership that is able to empower uh, the population and uh, go toward a common direction. Um, now I would like just to, to um, invite the, uh, the audience to kindly fill in a, a quick questionnaire uh, that is available on the Q&A uh, session. You can uh, do it, it won't take a long time, uh, uh, just a few uh, minutes and we deeply uh, help uh, the uh, UNESCO and the Organization of Future uh, activities. So um, I would like now to um, um, move just a second. We will move now to the uh, questions from the Q and A. So uh, I will read the first one from uh, um, uh, Ade Olaya, uh, MA. Many uh, grassroots organizations had difficulty securing funding due to the austere fiscal policies in the EU before COVID-19, although they provide much needed services to minority communities. How can UNESCO assist these minority-led organizations to continue to engage through community participation in policymaking to reduce racism and discrimination? So this is a, a, an open question and uh, um, uh, the, uh, I would like to ask if any of the experts would like to, to tackle, tackle it. Can I maybe um, try and give a brief answer, um, which is just really to, I think, for funding organizations to be self-critical and to look at our processes because um, some of our structures, some of our necessary bureaucracy gets in the way of quickly and easily being able to support small like organizations. We've definitely seen um, with funding that we, that we want to provide for anti-racist work, that for, especially for small organizations, 
um, filling in bond, uh, funding applications and proposals and all of this sort of thing can be really difficult and time consuming and is often not compensated either. So I guess for, for big organizations like ourselves to try and always strive to make those processes easier um, for small organizations and individuals to, to complete. And, and the point that was made in the speech around um, networks and sharing and partnership around uh, different cities in, in, in Europe is a, is a really good one because, of course, some small organizations have already been through that difficult process themselves and they can help others um, via those networks. I think that's a really good way of improving that situation. Thank you very much, uh, Glyn. I have uh, another question for Miss uh, Guillen. How can art help against racism? Uh, I'll encourage you to visit the exhibition on the Afghan artist Aziz Azara at the Fundacion Tapies. Well, thank you very much for the recommendation. I will check it out. It's actually not far away from uh, my office, Fundacion Tapies. But I wanted to answer in regard to how art can actually be uh, a tool uh, to fight against discrimination. I think this is very well known that uh, from the culture, uh, perspective, not only looking at um, recognition of diversity and historical memory, which is very much needed in order to build a local identity, that it's, uh, that it's actually diverse because it's what cities are, but also when it comes to how to engage young people, and it has a lot to do with uh, what Moha knows and Moha is, um, is doing and, and promoting. Uh, getting people involved in art is um, it's very engaging and uh, can help very much to this race awareness of what uh, racism is and what the uh, consequences of racism of racism can be. There are plenty of uh, different um, examples uh, and some of them more, uh, let's say, classical in the sense that are in the cultural. Uh, arena, uh, but other that are contraculture and that are happening in the street and that uh, is helping us to open our eyes very much. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Guillen. Uh, there is another question uh, from uh, Mr. Handaine. Uh, on peut parler aussi de la discrimination linguistique dans le cas de l'immigration. Qu'est-ce que vous à ce sujet? So we can also speak uh, about the discrimination of, uh, uh, when dealing with what migration. What do you that? think on this uh, issue? Uh, um, maybe I will, uh, peut-être je vais inviter le professeur Eyer à s'exprimer uh, sur ce I'll sujet et je vois uh, que monsieur, uh, elle aussi, Mr. Uh, Jerry, who would to, like to uh, uh, answer uh, react. this topic. Je vais laisser M. Guéréou répondre, c'est juste que des fois la langue se superpose avec l'origine géographique. Uh, allow Mr. Gregu to answer, but sometimes uh, there is a very uh, okay, yes, between uh, overlapping example, between language uh, and uh, like, the uh, geographic ago, origin. In, in, in the, I work for a, um, a newspaper called El Diario Pumpes, and we publish a story about uh, when a, a migrant man uh, was from, uh, I think, uh, Bangladesh, and and he called uh, uh, different times to the uh, to the hospital because he was feeling sick. Uh, later, he was uh, uh, he didn't uh, got in conversation with the uh, workers, health workers, because uh, they didn't understand him. And finally, he died because he didn't uh, he couldn't explain what was happening to him. Uh, there was no uh, uh, people. There was there weren't any translator, uh, so he finally uh, died. And we were asking what would have happened if he had uh, done that uh, translation service, or if he had a, a way to get in touch with these with those health workers. We will never know. But we, what we can uh, see and what we can say is that uh, that, that discrimination uh, was uh, one of the um, 
uh, motives because uh, why he, he he has that and i think that's important and we must guarantee the access for the migrants for the people who uh, don't know the language uh, and the people who are learning it uh, we have to give the tools for them uh, to communicate and to have a, a correct access to the to the to the services Thank you very much, Jerry. Uh, Miss Guillen would like to add something. Yeah, because I think it's a very uh, important point, actually. And I'm going to look not from the uh, very strong case that Moha just uh, related and that happened here. Um, when it comes to what is the public information that from the administration we are giving to our citizens, language is an issue, very much. And uh, that it's something that we need to have and get in, have into account. And not only when it comes, for instance, you will get from uh, local authorities, everything that has to do with um, migration uh, and like what services migrants can find in the city. Usually, like we translate all this information into the different languages and the most spoken languages in our cities. But then some other information that have nothing to do with the fact that you are a migrant, but with the fact that you are a citizen of the, of the city, is not uh, translated into other languages and things that will have to do, for instance, with uh, participation and political participation in the city or uh, health, as Moha was explaining, or things with schools. Uh, so there is, we need to make up uh, an effort to how to optimize the public information that we are giving to our residents, to our citizens. And the increased diversity of our cities, it's a fact, it's what it is. The city is like this and we have all these different nationalities and we have all these different languages. Of course, we need to also invest money on language courses and uh, all, all these things, but we, can't forget the fact that uh, there is a need for communicating with our citizens and they are our, uh, our citizens as well. Um, and yeah, and that's resources again. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, of course, there is an interesting topic, but I'm not sure we will have the time to discuss is the difference between uh, a, a citizen and, and uh, uh, which has a nationality and a resident. And so cities now are more and more uh, embracing this vision of resident. So when asked uh, how many uh, migrants there are in a city, they say none, none there. We only have, we only have citizen uh, of uh, residents in Barcelona. We only have residents in Palermo, in Rome and so on. Um, I just would like on this uh, topic of um, uh, linguistic uh, uh, difference and, and discrimination have uh, the uh, very briefly uh, because we're running out of time unfortunately um, uh, the take of Professor Payande. Um, I think I can just um, just to add an, another dimension that um, of course we have the um, the aspect that has been mentioned now that um, it is it is it is important to have um, um, interpretation and 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 facilitate uh, communication uh, communication but also that of course language can also be a proxy for um, for racial discrimination and it's one of the categories um, next to ethnic background or, or skin color um, that can be uh, that can be used as an indication so a discrimination on the basis of language can also be uh, racist discrimination just to add this point to the picture Thank you very much, uh, Professor. So we are coming close to the conclusion of today's uh, um, consultation. And um, it's now time to uh, identify the key messages that we can take with us and that can uh, try to implement and can guide uh, UNESCO in the, in the future action. So the, the question I will ask uh, all of you uh, to respond in a very brief uh, uh, moment, just a few words, two minutes maximum, I know it will be hard because it's an interesting question. How do you see UNESCO's role as an international organization in the global fight against racism? What are your recommendations on the way forward? And before uh, leaving the floor to our uh, guests, to our uh, speakers, I would like to um, uh, request, kindly demand the, the technical support to have uh, the video from Mayor Nagel, who sent us his recommendation as well. 
How do you see UNESCO's role as an international organization in the global fight against racism? What are your recommendations on the way forward? I always say the UNESCO is the soft power of the United Nations. UNESCO convinces cities and their citizens that education, science and culture are the essential tools for development and for our future. I fully agree. These factors also help to oppose racism. My recommendations, therefore, please continue and strengthen the cooperation between cities and networks like ICAR, support data collections and research on the local level to better understand the phenomenon and its causes, identify successful approaches to eliminate discrimination in the different areas of societies, share your experiences and lessons learned in the fight against discrimination and always remain vigilant and work together with mayors. Perfect, we have heard the voice of uh, the mayor and uh, now I take uh, uh, the opportunity to ask the same question. Uh, starting, on va uh, peut-être commencer avec uh, uh, Madame la Professeur Heyer. Donc, uh, la, la Let us start with uh, Miss Heyer. The question is, uh, according to you, what should be the role of UNESCO as an international organization in the global fight against racism and what uh, are your recommendations moving forward? Well, I think it is really difficult to, to supplement what the mayor just said because he's absolutely right. I would simply add that UNESCO could come up with some guidelines for data collection, if possible, so that we can have uh, uh, comparable data from one country to the next. Uh, I think this would be an interesting exercise uh, to publish guidelines on this subject. And then I would say that, of course, uh, UNESCO needs to pursue uh, its current activities. Thank you very much. Thank you. Professor Ms. Guillen, would you like to give your views on this? very much look at the long run policies, the policies that can have uh, transformative uh, potential. And in here we will get into the discussion about what uh, anti-racism or interculturality uh, actions can be taken in order to, um, to change what the structural and institutional racism looks like. Uh, sometimes look at, at historical uh, memory recognition of diversity, of this um, idea of mankind uh, is diverse itself and how we can build on this um, global identity that is diverse. And as I said, that from the local administration where we are very much working on the feeling of belonging. Um, and I think from a global perspective here, UNESCO can play a role. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Jerehu. Thank you. Uh, so I will propose uh, to create an, an observatory uh, run by, by the UNESCO, an observatory that can coordinate uh, what uh, organizations are doing in uh, uh, collecting data related to, to racism. And I think uh, uh, the institutions have, have an, an important role coordinating uh, uh, how uh, this data is collected and coordinated uh, the different organizations that are in the different countries. I, I find that in Spain there are some organizations that collect data, but some of the so most of the times those data collide or uh, maybe they don't have like a, a common uh, perspective. So I think uh, there should be kind of a I propose an observatory that can coordinate all these organizations and push them to the same uh, uh, goal. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Jerehu and uh, Mr. Glynn. Thank you. Uh, my recommendation would to UNESCO would to be brave, to be explicit about racism, to, uh, to be a champion of 
anti-racism um, because it has such a powerful position. Um, its voice is so important. Um, and so take the responsibility as you are doing by holding this consultation, of course, to, uh, to demonstrate to everybody how important this issue is. Being careful to ensure that this is a movement, not just a moment in history when these things have uh, become more important. I would recommend that um, uh, UNESCO looks at um, ways in which to hold to account, to hold the organizations with which it works to account for the work they do on anti-racism and how they are changing and developing their structures to continue a long-term focus on this question. Um, and I would also support the point made already about data collection, that maybe there's something UNESCO can do around uh, having, you know, supporting some work around standardization, around a common minimum standard of data collection, so that um, for those who prefer the statistical uh, evidence approach, that um, there is something that can be provided there. Um, and the final point would be sharing. You know, this network is a, a superb network. Things that don't work, it's important to share those um, because we don't want people to make the same mistakes twice. But things that do work, uh, it's great to share those examples so that everybody benefits from them. Thank you very much, Mr. Glean. Professor Payande. Thank you very much. Um, I can only support and underline what has been said um, before. I think UNESCO could, uh, should understand itself as part of the broad international network of organizations and institutions working to battle um, racist, racial discrimination. Um, they should contribute and, uh, in developing common standards, recommendations and best practices. The point about um, data collection I can only underline. Um, and maybe I think um, one of the focus uh, points of UNESCO could be on the economic, social and cultural dimension of, um, of, of, of racial discrimination, um, addressing questions, for example, as special measures, positive measures, um, supporting groups that are disproportionately affected, um, and also employing a consultative uh, participatory approach, um, integrating the, the voice of the people and the groups that are actually affected into this process. Thank you. Thank you very much uh, to all of our speakers. It has been an extremely enriching and inspiring session. Uh, personally, uh, my takeaways is that uh, we are dealing with a, a society that has many problems, but has at the same time uh, a lot of uh, uh, strengths, a lot of uh, possibilities uh, to be uh, developed. Uh, in the right way. And the right way, of course, is a, a political leadership which is inclusive, which is able to uh, empower, to harness this potential. And uh, uh, I think we have heard from this last round of contributions that uh, UNESCO has a very important role to play uh, in terms of guidance, in terms of providing uh, other layers of government and civil society with uh, what is needed. We have heard this strong accent uh, on that. Uh, and basically that we are going towards a, a new era of strengthened uh, multi-stakeholder and multi-level cooperation with all levels of government, public and private sector moving towards uh, this uh, uh, brighter future. This is definitely an optimistic view, I understand, but once again, we are experiencing a momentum and it's now the time to act all together. Uh, I have now uh, the pleasure to uh, uh, leave the floor uh, for the concluding remarks to uh, Ms. Uh, Anna Maria Majlöf, uh, Chief of the Inclusion and Rights Section at UNESCO. Thank you very, very much, Lorenzo, for a job well done. And thank you to all the great speakers, really, for analysis and very forward-looking recommendations that you have provided on a topic that is of really primary importance to all of us, and especially, of course, in the current context. Um, this consultation and also those that will follow and those that we had previously uh, will allow us really to better understand which are the best practices, learnings and policies against discrimination and racism, including gender-based discrimination. That is very important. Uh, to what extent uh, slavery and racism are intertwined, 
and also the evolution of racism and its effect on the identity of all of, our, of, all of us. The importance of promoting culture uh, as a means to combat racism, and of course the very important role of young women and men, men that they play in combating racism and discrimination, and the urgent need also to fill the data and information gap, not only in Europe, but also in the other regions. So your uh, recommendations and the questions asked by our very engaged audience uh, will contribute to the elaboration of a roadmap uh, that will guide UNESCO's work along with practical online and also offline tools. Um, so to conclude, I would just like to remind you that this was the third out of six regional expert consultations. And the fourth one uh, will take place on the coming Friday, on the 9th of October, and it will focus on Latin America and the Caribbean. So I will stop here and a big thanks to all of you on behalf of all of us. Have a nice day. Thank you. Bonne journée à vous tous. Au revoir et merci à tous. Au revoir. Thank you very much. Au revoir. Adieu. Adieu. Buenos días.